Okay, hello everyone. Thank you for being here. I want to give a uh, quick thank you to Rose and Will Marcinkowski, who sent me wonderful birthday cards yesterday. And their grandmother, Eva, sent our office a wonderful birthday cake. So thank you for that. Um, to get into uh, the business at hand, uh, we have seen as the uh, testing results continue to come back in a robust way, uh, the positives continue to increase. Uh, that is the same today. Um, we also know that this disease spreads quickly uh, and people can have uh, symptoms that are very mild but can become much worse in a quick period of time. So here are some numbers. Today we currently have 111 cases. That's up from 81 cases yesterday. We've more than doubled our cases since Monday. These statistics, these statistics should be troubling. Uh, we knew they would get higher, but hopefully this impact will get everybody's attention. I'm going to talk about social distancing first before we get into uh, the, what the data looks like specifically. The, uh, right now, we are doing everything we can to get people to social distance. We need your help. Today is a nice day. I wish it was still snowing, but people are out, they are about, and we are getting multiple reports of people not abiding by the rules, and we have sent our park rangers out to our parks. We will be implementing a one-third of the parking lot full, then we will shut down the parking lots, and anyone who parks outside of our parking lots, we will have the cars towed. We received troubling pictures from many people at closed golf courses or other golf courses where people are tailgating. Uh, certainly, uh, we've received other reports of businesses that are not supposed to be open, but are opening at night and people are going into there to drink and to party. Uh, certainly in New York City, it can be argued that the density has helped drive the numbers in that community, and I think that makes sense. But in our community, we don't have that argument. We can do our part, and we can starve this virus if we work together. So to that end, as I alluded to yesterday, we have implemented systems now where our 911 dispatchers will take calls related to social distancing. And we have worked with our police departments throughout our towns and villages, and our police departments will now respond to these calls. So if you see a situation in the public where there are groups of individuals, whether they're at, at a park and they're congregating uh, without being four or five feet away, uh, or if individuals are tailgating uh, and or doing things where there are large gatherings, you can now call 911 and we have systems in place to make sure that law enforcement addresses these concerns. Uh, going into some of the data on the day, we have 16 folks in hospitals, four are in critical condition. We have 60 females and 51 males. We have four individuals under 19. We have 26 individuals in their 20s. Uh, to take a pause here, I know that some people have been critical of our assessment going into talking about individuals who are younger. The reason why we continue to talk about this and ask for cooperation for individuals in their 20s and their 30s is because it's not just an issue here locally, but we are on conference calls during the day with the National Association of Counties and the White House, and this is a problem we're seeing across the country. So we're not trying to pick on one age demographic, but ask for their cooperation and point out the obvious that we need to take this seriously and many in this age demographic have not taken it seriously enough. So we're not trying to pick on people. Many people who have COVID-19 who are in this demographic have done nothing wrong, but there is a trend and it's a national trend that we're seeing larger numbers in these demographics than which people and the experts believe we should be. And much of that is due to, uh, at least in the beginning part of this 
spread in our country, uh, these demographics not taking this virus seriously. So saying that, uh, we have 15 individuals in their 30s, 18 in their 40s, 19 in their 50s, 15 in their 60s, 12 in their 70s, and two individuals in their 80s. Uh, we have 300 people are currently in mandatory isolation and quarantine. This is a moving target. Uh, this number will increase. We had 30 new in, uh, individuals with positive results. Our health department has started to go into their investigations and their quarantines. Uh, this number will get larger. Uh, to break down percentages, 27% uh, of our positive cases are under 30, 41% are under 40, 57% are under 50, 74% are under 60, and 26% are over 60. Uh, breakdown by municipality, City of Syracuse 36, Clay 16, Cicero 12, Salina 11, Onondaga 6, Manlius 6, Camillus 5, Skinny Atlas 4, DeWitt 4, Pompey 4, Lysander 3, Geddes 1, Lafayette 1, Spafford 1, and Van Buren 1. Uh, when, when our uh, health department is notified of a positive case, we go into an investigation right away. Uh, when there are gaps in the investigation, we'll notify the public about these gaps. Uh, we oftentimes communicate with employers. Mm -hmm. There is a perception and, a, and an anxiety and a fear that if someone gets a positive case and you work in their building uh, and there is a chance that you may have walked by them or they may have been this or that, uh, these are all factors that are considered uh, into our investigation. And if you have direct contact with these individuals, certainly the health department will ask you to be under a quarantine. But when there's gaps, we're going to ask the public for help uh, for the time periods in the investigation where there are gaps. Uh, we talked about uh, three different occasions where there was gaps in the investigation. We needed the public's help uh, so that we could assess uh, the type of contact you may or may had. Uh, it, it, for the most part, if you have contact uh, with someone and they're not sick and then they get sick later on, you're not going to be asked to be under a quarantine. Uh, testing. We had a big day with tests coming back. That's why we saw the spike in the numbers. We've had 2,200 tests. We have 111 positives. Our, uh, that means that we got 675 tests back since yesterday. Some of the backlog that has been reported on from the first three days, the 16th, the 17th, and 18th, at the testing triage site is being addressed. Many of these cases are now getting back in. Uh, the uh, many, many tests have come back. Uh, we anticipate that the rest of those backlogs will be addressed later today and tomorrow. Uh, I've spoken individually with many individuals who are in that circumstance. They, that if they email my office and they say, I got a test on the 17th, this is where I am. I've emailed many of them, I've called many of them and talked to many of them. I'm happy to report many of them are feeling better, which is good. They still need to wait for their test or we've offered them the ability to come and get a new test uh, if they want to uh, get in, have two tests out there with the results coming back. So we've uh, had a lot of these conversations, but we're very happy that we received 675 tests back within the last 24 hours. As are expected, we'll, we'll see more test results back. Uh, and then I think we'll be at the point in the next 48 hours where we will be very close to real time when it comes to our tests that are taken. 24 to 48 hours later, they're coming back. So that will start to look like, hopefully, the curve will get to its peak because we have all of our data back. Uh, mind you, testing, we are testing people who are sick. If people who are sick and are not asking for tests, they're still out there. That doesn't mean that there's not COVID-19 out in the community. Uh, again, uh, just like we were talking about weeks ago before we had cases, we had a rule and it made sense. If you're sick, don't go to work. 
and we said that. We got together many, many times before we even had a positive case. We said, if you're sick, you may have something wrong with you, right? That's why you're sick. You shouldn't spread that anyways. Now we don't need you spreading COVID-19. Uh, so if you're sick, don't go to work. Common sense. Um, I think most people listened to that. Some people didn't. But now if you're an essential employee at an essential business, that rule is the golden rule. If you are sick, don't go to work, period. So that's still the case. And if you do that, we'll continue to do the, the we'll continue to see this hopefully going in the right direction. So overall, 5% of those tested have tested positive. That's within the averages that we're seeing, uh, you know, depending on what averages you're looking at, maybe a little bit below, but uh, certainly that percentage went down from yesterday. This is a fluid situation. Some days the percentages go up, some days they go down. Um, process after a positive result. Let's go through this. Uh, po after a positive test, our health department will be contacting you to check on your status and to begin their surveillance investigation. You should also remain in close contact with your primary care doctor as well. Uh, and they will continually monitor your progress. If you are sick and you're one of our positives and your symptoms start going from mild to a little bit more robust symptoms, you need to call your doctor and talk to your doctor throughout that process. Uh, besides the positive test, there's now over 300 people in quarantine due to exposure to a positive case. So we now have over 400 people in mandatory isolation and quarantine in our county. Our staff rightfully focuses in on the positive cases, but we will get to the quarantine cases as well. When we get a slew of new positives like today, our health department is going at a robust speed in a rigorous way to get in front of these investigations to figure out the new sets of quarantines. Uh, those in quarantine due to possible exposure should stay alert to their symptoms and stay in close contact with their doctor. We are also going to start having people come off quarantine soon, so there's a lot in process. Uh, we are going to start seeing people who are positive better, and we'll be able to get them and update those, how many people have recovered, but also we're going to have people coming out of the quarantines, uh, and that's important. Please answer your calls from our health department but keep your doctor informed on your status throughout quarantine, especially if during your quarantine you become symptomatic. Uh, as a reminder, anyone who's been tested must stay in quarantine until you get your results. Uh, again, back to some of the people who are backlogged, we think your problem uh, with getting the results on the 17th and 18th are now probably okay uh, over later today or tomorrow, but We've offered yesterday, and the offer is today, you can come back to the triage testing site at the Syracuse Community Health Center and get tested again, uh, if, if that makes you more comfortable. Again, I've talked to many of you, my office has talked to many of you, but uh, if that makes you more comfortable, please come and do that. Again, dispelling rumors, there is no curfew at this time. Uh, the scam artists uh, that are out there trying to prey on our vulnerable in this time, uh, no one in the government's ever going to call you and ask for your social security number. Tomorrow at the briefing, we're going to have Sheriff Conway talk about some of the things the sheriff is seeing uh, and help the public with that. Hospitals and surge capacity. Uh, if you watch the briefings from the governor, you're seeing the governor and their team look at strategies for surge capacity in many of our downstate communities uh, where the numbers are robust uh, ICU beds are becoming a challenge, uh, hospital beds are becoming a challenge. The governor has put out a 50% mandatory uh, increase in capacity for hospitals. If hospitals can go above 50%, that's the recommendation. Um, our hospital infrastructure is the same it was yesterday as the day before. We're in good shape. Uh, we have plenty of ICU beds, but that does not mean we are not planning for a surge in our community for a worst case scenario. Uh, so we've been through this planning. Uh, I've shared with you that we're working for an offsite facility to assist our hospital infrastructure should we need it. This is part of an overall partnership with our hospitals that has been ongoing since the day we, we knew that this would become a threat to our community. Uh, now that the hospitals have submitted their plans for the state, 
we've been able to assess what those plans look like and really start to finalize what our surge site will be. Uh, we will have a surge site if necessary. We hope we don't ever have to have that surge site. We will also begin planning for additional surge sites if that's the case. Uh, I'm very happy with, in the, with partnership from Syracuse University and especially a big thank you to Chancellor Severud who has been an absolute community uh, team player throughout this. Our surge site in the event we need one will be located at Manley Fieldhouse. Uh, this process and some of this planning will unfold. Uh, once you have a site, you have to purchase many items that will go into the site to build out the site. Certainly Manly Fieldhouse gives us a lot of flexibility to, uh, to build out an initial site, to increase capacity as needed. So we're very, very thankful for Chan with, uh, to Chancellor Severud, and we're also looking at uh, other surge sites as well. Uh, access to assistance, I'm just going to go through some of these bullets. We'll give briefings on daily numbers once or twice a week moving forward, um, but important phone numbers. Uh, certainly I want to thank all my partners uh, in government and all our nonprofits, our teams that have been working now uh, well over uh, four weeks now, 24-7, to address the needs of the community. Our upstate triage hotline, this is a hotline you call uh, if you have no insurance or you have questions or sometimes your primary care providers may have you call this line to talk about your medical conditions, 315-464-3979. Our senior health care worker and adult nutrition hotline. This is the hotline where we've been really addressing our new class of, of uh, dependent individuals in our community that need our help, our independent seniors, uh, also healthcare workers who are working 24-7, uh, and even uh, essential business workers, if you run into this case, we're here to help you. We're not leaving anybody behind in this process. Uh, this phone number is 315-218-1987. Child Care Solutions, uh, for any daycare needs for essential businesses, any of our healthcare workers, uh, EMS emergency management workers, uh, any, any child care concerns, emergency th concerns, we have daycare slots available for you free of charge during this process. Uh, phone number 315-435-1220. Donations of PPE, it's emergency gear for our medical professionals. You've heard us talk about this. If you have PPE, you're a business, you're, you're a uh, practitioner, uh, and you're doing elective surgeries, now you have some resources that you want to give to us so we can distribute them to nursing homes and to hospitals. We thank you for that. Uh, PPE donations, 315-435-2525, or you can email us at emweb01 at ongov.net to our emergency management department. Uh, we want to uh, thank all of our volunteers. There's so many people volunteering right now. Um, I had an individual want to volunteer to deliver meals, and that individual has a cane to walk. That person uh, really isn't uh, someone who should be delivering meals, but I think it talks about the spirit that we have in central New York that even though they, are, they have an impairment, they want to give back and they feel that urge to give back. So uh, very special people in our community. So I think the spirit is strong. Uh, Volunteers Central New York, phone number 315-428-2229. Our medical volunteers sign up uh, for all of our medical volunteers. Uh, Dr. Gupta's team has a, a robust list of volunteers that she and her team stay in communication with. But certainly, if you have a skill set, uh, we, we would love you to be on this list in the event down the road that things uh, go in a path that we do not want them to go. Uh, we're going to need all hands on deck. Our medical volunteer is sign up is www.ongov, that's O N G O V, dot net slash medical volunteers. And as always, we want to have people call 211 as they go through this process uh, if they need to talk to somebody. 
what we're talking about, mental health, anxiety, uh, dealing with many of these things. Uh, today's a nice day. People can go outside. Uh, we have some people not taking advantage of the circumstances, but uh, we need people to take care of themselves, especially parents. Take care of yourselves and your mental health so you can help out with your kids who are going through a lot as well. Saying that, uh, myself or uh, Dr. Gupta can take some questions. And if we yeah. look at the trends of people starting to feel sick and going for testing, are those still in a positive direction? They are. Uh, we've seen uh, five straight days where uh, testing demand uh, is down. And it, it's, you, you, it's really, Andrew, kind of been a flattening demand. Was up here, it's come down, now we're flattening. Um, so that presents an opportunity for the community, and at times I think um, you can sense frustration uh, when it seems like our community is not going to take advantage of this moment in time. Uh, we knew when we had a spike last Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, at some point that spike in uh, individuals who are sick is going to come through with positive results. We've seen that spike in the last three days. I think that lets the community know how real this is and how uh, this is a threat, uh, and it's a threat to your health. And then the longer it's a threat to our public health, it's a threat to our overall economy and the rest of our society as well. So we knew we would get to these numbers. We wish we got there maybe a day or two earlier. But what I think we've seen, which is, uh, I, I think, hopeful, is we got a lot of tests back. Now Dr. Gupta and her team got to go and do their jobs. And they, and they do their jobs very, very well. And then we're going to get people in quarantine. And now we're going to start seeing people coming out of quarantine. Uh, we're going to start seeing people get better. Um, I'm very happy that I, you know, part of this, which is frustrating for me, and I, I tease Dr. Gupta about this, but she doesn't let me know who any of these people are. Now they're starting to contact me, and I get to talk to them and, uh, you know, see how they're doing. Uh, and I want them to know that they've done nothing wrong. They just got sick. And I don't, I, I think there's still stigma out there. And people are still, you know, scared. Uh, they don't want to really go out and tell their story. We want some people to tell their story uh, because they're kind of nervous. Um, but overall, I think the data went higher. We knew it would. We probably have another day or two of the data going higher. Uh, but then we're going to be in kind of real time with results. And when you're doing 100 to 150 tests a day in the community uh, at large, that might mean 100 tests in Onondaga County, um, if the percentages hold up, you start to see smaller numbers of cases, which allows our health department to go investigate those quicker, quarantine quicker, uh, kind of correlate more of the cases to figure out uh, which ones are connected. Uh, and then uh, certainly as more time goes on with our quarantine uh, residents uh, that aren't symptomatic, they come off quarantine. That means we're going to have less people that we're worried about in that bracket as well. So. We, we have an opportunity now because we did robust testing. We're getting the data, we're getting the information, we're responding. Was this the most number of cases, uh, was this the most number of test results returned? Oh yeah, I just triple what we've gotten in any other, any other period of time. Yeah. The governor um, has said that he's looking to shift some of the load from the downstate hospitals to the upstate hospitals. Is the county prepared if it comes to that? Yeah, so look at, um, I spoke to the governor's office today on a couple of different items, and uh, you know we we are uh, Central New Yorkers. We are New Yorkers. We are Americans, and we have been ahead of this curve because we have a lot of smart doctors giving public officials a lot of smart advice, and uh, every decision we've made was to get to the point where our medical infrastructure can perform for Onondaga County residents, Central New Yorkers northern New Yorkers who use these same doctors. Um, and we're in a position now where uh, there may be some surplus with this 50% increase in capacity. And we know at some point there may be individuals from outside of central New York uh, that come into our community because they're sick, because of our robust infrastructure. 
what my conversation with the governor's team is is absolutely we're we're all we're all in this together i've said this for two years we're all in this together um, but we need to make sure that we have beds available for central new yorkers and northern new yorkers so we need to have conversations about what that looks like and so we can work that into our planning uh, and and certainly the governor's team was receptive to that message um, rensselaer county is asked the governor to try and stop travel from New York City into their county. When you were talking with the governor, did you propose that too? Yeah, I, I, no, we didn't. I didn't talk to the governor. I talked to his team. Um, if the governor wants to call me, I know he's busy. I'd love to talk to him. Uh, but the, uh, I think it's, it's, a, it's a point that's being debated and it's being talked about, right, uh, throughout the country. And so I, my position is I understand why that is being debated why people who may be exposed drive into a community that doesn't have community spread and they may bring that. And then if they don't follow social distancing, it may create a new level and layer of community spread. That is a fair concern and a fair point. We are so connected together in New York State via infrastructure that that call needs to be made at the state level. I think Rensselaer's County Executive, who I know well, asked the state to allow that. Whether they do or not, uh, I don't know. But I think it is a fair point, and I think a point, uh, a common sense point for anyone in New York State, anyone in the country right now that has a hot spot or hot spots around it, some parts of the country don't even have as many cases as Onondaga County, some states. Um, and that's, you know, we can get into funding bills and things like that. I think the governor talked a little bit about some of the stuff, but I have an argument to make. I should be getting more money than other states. Uh, and so... Um, but I think a fair point when it comes to travel for anybody who lives in New York State, you are safest at home, wherever home is, you are safest there. And the best way to starve the virus, whether you're in Onondaga County, Erie County, Rensselaer County, or Long Island, is for people to stay home. Um, you mentioned earlier that it's a nice day, people are outside. You said that some businesses have been having operations at night yeah. do you have a number of how many incidents your police have responded to with i don't i don't tony i think um we've set up an infrastructure now where we can we, we have a system at 911 now where we'll be able to monitor that data uh we we were hopeful that this wasn't going to be an issue um it's a we're, we're seeing some trends uh you know our parks is sensitive because we want people to go out for their mental health but we can't have parks overloaded where social distancing isn't being practiced. The reality is it's different if you're taking a walk with your significant other or your children, whereas if you were exposed to something, they probably were too. Well, we're, but it's a different reality when there's so many people in a close proximity that you're exposing household to household. So um, that's why our park rangers are now gonna be robustly monitoring our park system and uh, certainly we're going to be enforcing various things. Our 911 is now ready specifically to dispatch people related to social distancing calls, which was certain something that, that we never thought we would be at, right? Uh, you know, we've, we've talked about pressing charges against people who may break the quarantine. Um, for businesses who aren't following rules, have you guys talked about pressing legal action against them? Yeah, we're looking at, um, we believe our executive powers have different uh, kind of different ramifications than what the governors do. Uh, the governors we looked at are more civil. Ours have a misdemeanor element to it. So we're looking at right now adopting all of the governor's executive orders, which could make some of these uh, misdeeds more serious from a civil uh, and a misdemeanor. Uh, certainly our right now our court systems are are not we're, they're only handling the most important cases. We don't want to be in a position where uh, we have to get deal with these things. It's ridiculous we have to deal with these things, but at some point there's going to be an example. Uh, when that is, I, I don't know. Would you tell us more about the photos you've seen, where they came from, and yeah, what, what they show us? Look, we get a lot of people sending us photos. Uh, I think we saw a closed golf course. It was closed, um, but a lot of tailgating going on, a lot of people having fun. Um, can't do it. You know, when we ask you to stay at home, that doesn't mean you have people over for a party. You just can't do it. 
we, we do things, my team's working really hard, everybody's working really hard uh, to get this community to a point where we're in front of this, where we can start to flatten the curve. Uh, the, then after you flatten the curve, if you take social distancing really seriously for two or three weeks, the curve starts coming down. Uh, as soon as that curve starts coming down and, and we, in, in a systematic way, then maybe we talk about non-essential businesses uh, getting back to work and making things. And we talk about uh, the recovery in a more robust way. Uh, but right when we're starting to hopefully see some progress, let's not be stupid in, in ways that are just, we, we know better. We know better, right? There's a difference between tailgating where you're not supposed to be in public and being in a large group. What's the penalty if you are found violating social distancing? Yeah, we'll, we'll work with our, our law department and look at the, what the state orders are. Again, we talked about this. Uh, right now, There's uh, you're looking at civil penalties. You're looking at a, a lot of everything's moving and evolving in real time. There's different problems presenting themselves in real time. Uh, you're talking about local governments having to now police these problems we've never had to police yet. We're all putting our own departments, 75% of our people working from home. So uh, if we will get caught up on this and we will have uh, answers to this at some point uh, and we hope people just do what they should do. And for the most part, everybody is, but we have glaring examples where they aren't and then you'll see some demographic data that will suggest Maybe these demographics are not taking it as seriously. Uh, we're not suggesting that those individually, individuals, all of them, but certainly we believe some of them weren't taking it seriously. So th this is all evolving. Everything's evolving in this process. Um, we never thought we would have to give directions for 911 on how they're going to have to implement social distancing bandits uh, out there breaking laws, right? Well, that, that was my next question. As you mentioned, a change in process we're now 911 is on board, police departments are on board. What, what, what kind of conversations did you have to have with these entities in order yeah. to come up with something? And what does that something, that process look like? Yeah, you, well, look at our, our, my deputy county executive who's helping lead our fight in the pandemic has to go talk to 911 about this problem, sit down and have hours about how this works, to go train 911 operators, go then go to the police departments who have other things to do, then have to worry about chasing down eight or nine people or 10 or 11 people uh, having one too many cocktails. And so after eight or nine hours of planning, and if you add that up, these are all your tax dollars, how many people, uh, how much they make, cost real money because some people need to get together when they shouldn't be getting together to have a keg party. So uh, th these, are, these are the things that we don't, have real-time answers for because it's inconceivable. We never thought we would have to be doing these things. So at, at this point, how are the police handling it when they go to a group? They'll get a call from 911 to be dispatched to for a social distancing uh, complaint, and then now they'll be going uh, for that complaint as of today. And they, when they find it, what are they going to do? They they will do what they need to do. I'm not a cop, I, I'm, but I'm assuming they will either issue some sort of appearance ticket or they'll ask them to disperse. I'm sure the first few times will be please disperse because, but Tim, if you get something real egregious, at some point there's going to be an example. Uh, and uh, people need to, they need to take this seriously. The sooner we all take everything seriously, uh, the quicker we'll, we'll get back to normal. With schools, uh, do, have you talked to any superintendents lately? Do you have any updates on the, how long they're going to be closed for, if it's a, the closure's extending? Yeah, I think what we'll see and again, we're talking to superintendents quite a bit. Um, the, we've asked for clarification from the state if our order stands for April 14th or if the governor's order of April 1st stands. Uh, so that's some clarification we've asked for. But what is going to happen is the state is going to have to probably extend that, right? Um, April 1st is right around the corner. So I think you'll probably hear the governor talking about this uh, he's got a lot on his plate each day. Uh, this is something that he's going to probably, and his team will probably be addressing soon. Uh, certainly, we thought April 14th was a good day. It gave time to deal with the initial spike and surge. Uh, if we can see a curve flatten out a little bit, maybe, uh, then maybe have two weeks more 
and after the April 14th, you got real data that you can really assess. And then does that need to be extended two weeks from then? Uh, then you, those are the decisions you're making. What makes Manly Fieldhouse an appropriate surge site? Yeah, so it's got a, a lot of good infrastructure uh, built in. Obviously, big area, um, good, uh, you know, good ventilation. Uh, you can get a lot of beds in there, uh, and certainly there will have to be some improvements made to it specific to needs of a hospital. Uh, but those are things our emergency management team's working on right now with them and pl playing that forward. So uh, you want a, you know, the bigger the better. The governor's got the Javits Center that he's looking at, right? So if you have an, a piece of infrastructure in your community like that, you'd, you'd love to do that. And uh, certainly uh, we're very happy that Chancellor Severud has been such a great partner in this. Is the concept that that would be space for COVID patients or for other patients that would make space for COVID Yeah, yeah I think you could do either or, Tim. I think, um, I, I think we would then rely on the hospitals and Dr. Gupta to say, okay, we got 200, 100 beds over here. Um, maybe we have our, uh, our, our non-COVID, uh, non-ER type patients going there. We're gonna let the doctors drive that decision um, the key is we want to build up the infrastructure so that the doctors ha can make that decision if they have to. Hopefully they don't have to. Any estimate on how many beds you could fit at Manly? You could fit a lot. And so uh, we're, uh, we're looking at right now what we want phase one to look like uh, and then how quickly would we need a phase two, phase three uh, within that facility. And then if you had to go, we've got many hotel partners that are, are very interested. Uh, there's other facilities that we've identified too that we can build off of if need be. You've had a little more time to look at the bill that is being passed in Washington. Any indication how much money Onondaga County is going? Yeah, to it looks like so, Andrew. It looks like it's it's we're we're in a disappointing situation with that bill. Um, that bill, if you're a county over half a million, you're going to get aid directly to the county. Uh, we're at 470,000. So if they adjusted that bill to 450, we would know what aid we would get. We still believe that the state will get some aid for locals, but we don't control that process and we don't know what that process will look like. So I'm disappointed uh, because uh, 450, between 450 and 500,000, if you look at counties with that population across the country, I bet you, you there, there's five or below of us. I would be interested if, to see how many uh, actually that exists that is such a small number most counties are really under 200,000 people uh, or there are very few of us that are over 400 so um, that's not saying we're not going to get aid we just don't know what the aid looks like and how it would flow um, certainly part of any future stimulus package needs to look at the economic reality of the areas that have been hit the hardest. So the governor talked about New York State, what it means for their budget. The governor's right. <laughs> when you look at uh, how many cases we have in our state and how that impacts the budget, uh, not on what we're spending, because that FEMA is going to help with that, but on what we're losing because we have to shut everything down. And so I, certainly I think the federal government will have to deal with a, some sort of influx of capital to the states, but also to local governments like ours, who are our number one revenue is sales tax. What are the first decisions we made in this process? Shut this down, shut that down, cancel this, cancel that. Everything that would bring in revenue, we're canceling because of the good for the public health. Give me those parameters again. We're just too big of a county or just too We're small? just under, right? So half a million and above are getting a lot of money. Directly from the federal government? Yeah, yeah. And you're fearing now it's gonna to have to be funneled from the state government to you? That's what, it, that's what I believe it does say. And I don't, know what, I don't know what that process looks like. That's, I'm not suggesting the state won't give us money. I just don't know what it looks like. Whereas if you were talking about building surge hospitals, and I know that if that law was 450 and above, I'm in, and I know I'm getting 15 million bucks, uh, I can answer Tim Knauss's questions and then some because I'm going to go build this, 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 and this because this money has to go to COVID-19 
uh, related expenses. So we, we then really plan for a surge uh, in our community, uh, but now it, it's just not as clear what that means. There's other things in the bill that are good. They're good for uh, the workers, they're good for businesses. Uh, there'll be a little, little bit of money going into some, uh, some, you know, a lot of citizens' pockets to help them get caught up on their bills and spend a little bit of money online. Um, there's some good things there, but for Onondaga County, the money, we, we, we can't quantify what that looks like now. Do you have an ideal number? Look, I would like a lot of money. Uh, and, and so other counties are getting a lot of money. Long Island, the two counties in Long Island are getting half a billion dollars. Um, that's a lot of money. Uh, so uh, it, I've made the argument, you've heard me make this argument, that I show you all where, and I don't know where our chart went, but it's probably over there, um, all of the areas across the state that have come down to Daga County for testing, that is not just one county, it's over 20 counties. And when, and, and the timing of it is even, it shows how we, we are all in this together because when Albany County runs out of testing, we get 20 or 30 people coming from Albany County and we see the red the next day. And then in the Buffalo News reports, we're out of testing in Erie County for two days. Everybody from Erie County comes in, we see the red. Niagara County, Long Island, people from Long Island are calling, asking about their test results. Why are they calling from Long Island? Because they couldn't get tested in Long Island. So I've been saying we need to be treated from a funding standpoint, like a community over a million dollars. And if we were in this process, we would be talking about hundred, well over 10, 15, 20 million dollars coming into here for, for preparation for this. So I, I'm a little frustrated with that. Uh, I know our federal partners still got time and I know they're talking about a fourth round. Hopefully they can get that right. If, is, there, is there any kind of formal partnership you could forge with a smaller county yeah. that's maybe sent a lot of people here to make the pitch to the bill as it exists that actually you're going to give both these counties money because we're more than 500,000 and because Onondaga is yeah. putting the bill, we're going to get it. Yeah, I think, well, that's the pitch we're making, Andrew. I think the reality is, is they, when they do the law, they're, they're looking at the, the phrase is political subdivisions. So they're looking at each county as a political subdivision. Um, if you look at our, uh, our counties next to us, Madison and Oneida and Cayuga and Oswego, Cortland, even Broome, uh, on that one map, and we'll make sure it's here uh, updated tomorrow, is it's, it's ruby red, and it's ruby red because that's how many cases people have gone. When we talk about triage testing site cases, uh, you know, the, uh, w there's, I think we got another 400 or so outstanding. Again, 20% of those are from other areas. Uh, and we're happy, to be, we're, we're happy to be a part of that uh, and part of that solution because the doctors work here for the most part, but, but there's been cases where other communities come in when they run out of testing. And we don't turn anybody away. So when we're talking about need for help, that needs to happen. Speaking of that, do you still have enough test kits now we to do. carry you? And uh, are the results consistently now coming in 24 to 48 yep. hours? Yeah, we've seen a 24 to 48 hour turn time. Um, Krause's site, they do minimum testing over there. They're not that fast. Uh, on average, but right now out of the triage site in upstate, we're seeing that 24 to 48 hour uh, span, uh, which is uh, good, that's good. I mean, we, get, we're, we're, we got 675 tests in the last 24 hours. So a lot of those backlogs got taken care of. I'm not saying every one of them, because I've talked to some of them today who haven't gotten them yet. Uh, but that backlog is kind of gone. We expect to get a lot of tests tomorrow. Uh, and then hopefully the next Saturday, and then hopefully we're in real time. And yesterday at the triage site, we had 86 tests that were done. Uh, so when you look at you, you look at that curves flattened as far as demand goes across the board. So now what do we what do we do now? Uh, not as many people are sick with these types of symptoms in the community. We social distance and we try to starve the thing. Are you going to continue seven day a week testing at the community hall? Yeah. Center? Yep. How many tests have been completed total? Let me see if I got that. I think total, I think we're 
2600 range. I think some of those are outside of Onondaga County, though, uh, that's left. I would say in Onondaga County, we're probably looking at a 22. No, 2600, I would say, in Onondaga County uh, to date, around there. Are you any closer to getting upstate to be able to perform those tests, read the results? We, I know it's we, not we are not, yeah, yeah, the, the county, we, we, the government, don't, aren't in charge of that. Um, I have not heard uh, since Dr. Thomas was here if they're any closer with the manufacturer. And uh, certainly that would be, that would put us in a very good spot m moving forward. Uh, and I think we're almost there anyways, Trish. I think we're, uh, once we get to that point where we're, we, we got the backlog up to date and we got here, 24 to 48 hour turn times, um, we can work fast. And that can, that our health department can get uh, really on top of that. Your executive order states that people who are waiting for results must self-quarantine. Mm -hmm. um, people who choose to get retested, why, why should they have to leave their house to do that? Because they can, we allow them to do that. So for whatever reason, if someone was sick <coughs> and they were too sick to leave their house to go drive to the site, we would arrange transportation for them. And we're even talking with partners now about when we go to retest positive cases going to their homes. So we might talk about that tomorrow or Saturday um, because that's the next step of this process is how do you, Dr. Gupta is going to have guidance at, and she's going to set up her process for uh, determining who is positive, who's now gotten better, are they negative now? Part of that will be testing, and we're talking to partners that instead of making these individuals go to a <coughs> testing site or a hospital, maybe we can go to their homes. So this is something we're looking at uh, as a possibility. Hopefully we'll be able to talk about that in more detail soon. And do I understand right to be released from quarantine, you need to test negative? Released from quarantine? Uh, no. No? No, no, no. If, so if you're a mandatory ISO, if you're positive, uh, you uh, uh, have to, uh, right now, get a negative test, maybe two negative tests, uh, depending on what uh, Dr. Gupta's guidance is with CDC. <coughs> but I believe on a quarantine, you're, there, you're in there for a 14-day period of time, and if you're not symptomatic, I, our health department will go and determine that you're, you're good to go. Um, you said there's 16 people in the hospital, four critical. Can you give us the conditions on all the other cases in there? So the, uh, yeah, so uh, I, the individuals I've talked to, well, I, I, not, I can't give them all to you because I don't know all of them, but certainly 16 folks in the hospital, uh, we would say 12 of them are um, in good condition uh, to meet the medical term. Four of them are in critical, they're in a fight. Uh, then the other uh, individuals, so we're talking 18, we're talking the other 90 plus individuals are at home. Some of them are getting better. Some of them still not feeling so great. Uh, and they're at different parts of their quarantine. Uh, and so uh, we, I've talked to two or three individuals that are almost at the point where we're gonna get them retested and hopefully get negatives. And so we can then talk about how they're recovered. I heard from a viewer in Cayuga County whose wife was tested at the community health center, got a negative result. She's out of work because she works for um, some sort of food related uh, service. He stayed home from work in a protective way in case her test came back positive. He now needs paperwork proving it was a negative result, but he says he's tried everywhere, your office, the health department, to yeah. get paperwork, and I'm wondering if, if that's a process you're aware of? Yeah, we, well, we wouldn't be involved at all, the right? There, there's, hi, there's HIPAA, and if it's a Cayuga County resident, they will, their health department would need to be involved, because um, we don't, remember, a lot of people, I'm, I'm here with information about this, and a lot of people think I'm the answer to why this test isn't coming back. I don't own, I, I don't run the health care center or the hospitals, and I don't own the private sector companies that are doing the testing. What I am is somebody who's in a position where I can demand information to give to the public, and they are giving me information. So if you have a resident from Cayuga County 
our health department's not going to be involved in that process, even if they got tested in Onondaga County. That will be the Cayuga County Health Department. And, and I would think the Cayuga County Health Department could help get something for this individual. That doesn't make sense to me why they would not be able Are to. Are you aware of any general process that somebody who's isolating protectively but then a negative result comes back needs some sort of proof to return to normal life? I have not heard that specifically in my office yet. And mo if you're sending an email to my office, I'm getting it, okay? I read it, some, and I respond to most of them. Uh, sometimes my, my team gets to it before I do, but I respond to most of them. Of the 16 in the hospital, do you have any um, demographic breakdowns of that? I don't. I don't. Does the increase in the number of hospitalized cases, does, is, is, is there any way to project a trajectory from that as to which curve we're headed toward, you know, a spike or a, or a flattened one yet? I, I think when we look, I'm giving my own analytics here, Tim. Um, but I think what we've seen, and I think it's, it holds true, uh, is that when you look at our numbers of cases, you're going to have a three to six percent of those cases end up in the ICU, and then they're in a fight. And so uh, right now we have four. We know we had five in the ICU. We lost one of our neighbors. Um, so four out of 111 is, you know, 3% range right now. We ha it was at 6% for a while. It's gone down. Um, that's not saying any of these 12 won't, won't move over to that or uh, that anybody who's currently not at home won't move into the hospital. But we've seen when it comes to people going into the ICU, the 3 to 6% range of, of positives. Um, that's been a percentage that's held true, just like we've seen positives related to numbers of tests being that three to five percent range too. Are those four in critical? Are they on ventilators? I don't know if they're on ventilators or not. I, I would I would make some. Anybody can make assumptions that they're 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 in a fight. Just for statistical reasons, there's 16 currently in the hospital. So yep. The cumulative. Yeah, I think you probably had some people who were in the hospital that went home too. There's already uh, been discharges? Uh, I, I think we had a couple people that might have been in the hospital went home. It doesn't mean they have tested negative for COVID. That just means they're, they're, they're doing a little bit better, yeah. I think if my, my daily, as I go through these daily things, I believe at some point in that process, we had one or two people in that, that state. Any other questions? If there's been a couple of people who have left the hospital, do you know of any cases? We have 111 cases. Yeah. Any of them are quote unquote recovered yet? We won't have. We won't give uh, a recovered till they get a test and they test negative, right? We're almost there with some of these folks. Uh, D Dr. Gupta and her team are working on the guidance that they want to uh, establish uh, in their process for doing that. Um, but my hope is next week we're talking about. Recovery, recovery, recovery. What's yeah. the good news? Oh, now there's bad yeah. news. Go ahead. Tim, Tim's yeah. got the bad news yeah. over here, and then we got good news. I'm just wondering if you happen to know how many people came in to get a, a retest if, if they were frustrated waiting for the first one. I recommend, I, Tim, I got a lot of emails on this, so I sent a lot of them back and I called people. Uh, people were happy to hear from me and, and talk about it. Uh, I think they're going to get these results back today and tomorrow. Um, I said you can go and get a test, and you'll probably get the results back tomorrow or the next day. So then maybe you have two. But m a lot of the people I was very happy that I called uh, were in a situation where they're all feeling better. And so um, it, that's their call. I wanted to make sure they knew that I'll make sure you can get right in, uh, no questions asked, and get that done. But you don't know how many did. I don't know how many did. Ryan, what's the good news? Look, at, here, here's the good news, uh, Andrew. Uh, first off, I do want to say I got the good news for everybody who's wrote me these emails is right after I touch this podium, I spray my hands with my spray. Uh, people are very concerned about that. Uh, secondly, 
for the community, we are very happy we got 675 tests back. I was so happy. And now we're getting the information we need uh, to re and we're getting enough data where we can kind of make some informed decisions on planning for the next steps. So the good news is I think the log jam's over for test results uh, and we are getting to our neighbors and we are helping people who need the help they need and getting to them faster. So.